So um, I'm going to cover a bunch of things today. So first I'm going to do a, a case study, um, which looks at schemas and memory consolidation. Um, it's, uh, um, I'll first talk about the model uh, and the inspiration for the model in, from neuroscience and then, uh, and then go into the robot experiments. Uh, then I'll give a little WeBots demo on action selection uh, and uh, using something like subsumption architecture, but a, uh, a nice design method that you may be interested in uh, for designing uh, behaviors that have multiple actions or multiple behaviors. So very much like subsumption architecture. And then after that, uh, we'll go over the uh, midterm projects and just uh, I gave, tried to give all of you uh, some feedback on your projects, but I'll, I'll give sort of a kind of general feedback um, uh, on, on the midterms just in general and what I expect uh, going into the final project. All right, so before I get really into it, are there any uh, questions, comments, concerns? All right, um, let's first talk about uh, this model that uh, Tiffany, Tiffany Hu did for her dissertation. Uh, when was it last? Two years ago, I guess she graduated. Two years in the sp spring of 2019, I think is when she graduated uh, and presented. And then uh, I was, I presented this at a, at a meeting uh, and this is slides from the presentation and also her, her dissertation, um, which is this neurobiological model of something called schemas. Uh, and it gives the robot uh, contextual awareness. And we talked a little bit about memory consolidation and how there's rapid learning in the hippocampus and then slow over time consolidation in the neocortex. And uh, I think I even mentioned movies with that show amnesia in the movie plot line that, that uh, you see this, that you uh, can't, once you lose your hippocampus, you can't form uh, new memories, uh, but your long-term memories actually stay in place. Okay, uh, this was challenged recently uh, by some work from Richard Morris's group. And there's a lot of evidence, and this is a, a review paper by a woman named Van Kesteren and, and her colleagues. And I think I showed you this before. This was the SLIM model. This is a theoretical model, schema-linked interactions between medial prefrontal and medial temporal regions. So if you remember, the medial temporal lobe is where the hippocampus is. And the medial prefrontal cortex seems to control the hippocampus and uh, if something fits within uh, a context that it will suppress the hippocampus and allow that to be very rapidly consolidated into uh, this context or schema and long-term memory. Whereas if it's something new, then the medial temporal lobe is involved in creating this new context or schema memory that then has to over time be uh, consolidated into long-term memory in the neocortex. All right, so let's look at this experiment in a little more detail that, that challenged the standard model of consol consolidation and, and brought up the idea of schemas in rodents. So this was the setup by Say It All. So she uh, did work with Richard Morris, who's the famous Richard Morris of the Morris Water Maze. And there were these food wells and you would cue the rat with an odor. And then it would remember, try and remember where it smelled that odor, which food well had that odor because once you dig underneath the sand, then you would get food. And they made a layout, uh, they called them paired associates. So each of these was food paired with a different odor. And they had some, you know, landmarks. So if you had, under normal conditions, you could learn some new pairs, three hours later be tested and do pretty well. And 48 hours later, you could do pretty well. And you could go back and you could still uh, remember this. 
if you didn't have the hippocampus. You couldn't learn the new thing, but if it fit within a context, you had a uh, very good performance, uh, even if you only learned that uh, 48 hours before you lost your hippocampus, which means it was rapidly consolidated. So that challenged the idea that memory consolidation takes a lot of time. And it's worth going into their experimental timeline. Um, it's, it's a complicated experiment. And that, in fact, it's pretty hard to replicate from what I understand because of the complexity. Uh, but I think the result is solid and interesting and been, has been shown in other ways. But you start having the rat learn the schema and then you add two new paired associates, so associations of two new odors. And it's in the same layout so that uh, it's within the schema. And then right around here, two days before, uh, you give them two days to, after they've learned these, or after they've been presented, so you should say these paired associations, you, uh, you lesion the hippocampus. And then you give two more of these odors. And then to see if, you know, when we talk about catastrophic forgetting, to see if the rats are able to overcome catastrophic forgetting, uh, they give a different schema and then go back and test the original one, all right? So you guys follow that timeline? It's, it's com pretty complicated. And the things you should remember are these PTs, which are probe tests on the different uh, timelines because uh, those are key moments in, in uh, testing the memory of these rats. So let me see if I get this right, because it's always, um, it's, it's always, uh, like I said, complicated and tricky. So here's the, before the surgery, it's learned these two new paired associations that uh, fit within the original schema. And then this is a test of all of the original paired associations. Uh, and you see if you lesion the hippocampus, you should pay attention to the dark bars, which are when they cue the animal with an odor. Uh, it's doing well above chance, even though it doesn't have a hippocampus. But the key part is what about these two new ones that, um, that happened, uh, actually this is prior, 48 hours prior to, uh, Oh wait, this is the one. This is prior. Yeah, this is, um, this is, this should say be, this is the ones, these are the two that were actually, I told you, I get, I get, always get mixed up. This shows that the two new ones <laughs> that happened, uh, that they were presented 48 hours before surgery, after the surgery, uh, the animal remembers this even without a hippocampus. So that means it got rapidly consolidated. But the ones that were presented after the surgery shows that the hippocampus is necessary. So it's necessary to get this into memory, uh, but if it fits within a context, this is saying that it can very rapidly be consolidated into neocortex. Okay, hopefully I got that without confusing everyone. <laughs> And then uh, the ability to go back and remember the original uh, schema after all of this, like way in the, uh, the way, way late, uh, shows that they're able to retain this uh, over a long time without the hippocampus. And in a sense, they have this type of uh, amnesia. So the, the main findings of this was it's necessary for learning a schema. But the key thing that challenged, uh, key thing that challenged uh, the standard model of consolidation was hippocampus is ne necessary for learning new information consistent with the schema, but it can get into that, uh, it can get into that long-term memory very quickly. And uh, in a follow-up study, they showed, uh, say it all, showed that the medial prefrontal cortex was necessary for, for this learning. Uh, it increased. It increased the plasticity when a, a new schema or new information was consistent with the schema. So the, the learning was definitely driven by interactions with the medial prefrontal cortex in the hippocampus. Uh, and this idea of separating 
tasks or contexts into schemas, uh, you know, from, from an AI standpoint, might be the brain's way of preventing catastrophic forgetting. Okay, so that's the background. Uh, any questions about the, the background experiment? Okay, so let's now look at the model. So I'll first go over Tiffany's uh, model that was just uh, purely modeling before we get into the robotics and go into some of the details. I'll post this paper. Uh, this is discussed in the, in the chapter, but I'll post this uh, paper, which has a lot more of the details uh, on our, our uh, Canvas module. So she wanted to create a neural model to replicate these results uh, and show how the hippocampus and medial prefrontal uh, interact uh, and, and uh, prevent catastrophic forgetting. Uh, it showed because it was necessary uh, to have something like neuromodulation to play a role in the rapid consolidation uh, and in the learning of novel information. Um, and there's some, there's some predictions of this model, uh, which I'll go over later after the results about uh, how, the, how to sparsely represent information and uh, theta synchrony between the medial prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus and, and what that might mean to consolidating memory. Uh, and this might have some uh, transfer to applications, which I'll show in robotics, but maybe AI and machine learning in general. Okay, so here's the model architecture. Um, there's a context pattern. There's a medial prefrontal cortex that has neurons that respond to a specific schema. And there's a ventral and dorsal hippocampus. And the dorsal hippocampus learns a triplet of, of schema, uh, the odor cue, and the action, which is a, a basically a place cell that represents where uh, where that well is that has that odor. And um, she modeled this after an idea about how hippocampus uh, points to memories called the hippocampal indexing theory. So the hippocampus in this model is, is very sparse, uh, has very sparse activity, uh, and the activity is basically an index to these three things. Uh, and so that, that's a, another working model of how the hippocampus, uh, which is smaller than the neocortex, actually brings back full memories. Uh, it's like, a, if you're a computer scientist, it's like a hashtag with index pointers to uh, different cortical columns uh, is, is kind of the abstract idea of this model. In addition, there were neuromodulators, uh, generic neuromodulators that signal how familiar uh, this schema and context pattern were and how novel uh, this triplet might be. And she divided this into two different streams, an indexing stream, which builds that uh, hippocampal index to memory, and a representation stream that uh, learns associations between cues uh, and actions. And so let's just briefly look at these just to show you the, you know, in this, which is a fairly complicated model, uh, hopefully a lot of these equations and ideas are starting to look familiar. Uh, so the activity in the indexing stream is uh, based on the weights and the, pre, the activity of the presynaptic, uh, presynaptic neurons. And so that's the dot product. And then the activation function is the ReLU plus uh, you get all the activities in these different neurons and you do a winner take all, which a lot of times we do. So the only, so only this makes it very sparse. So only, whoops, only the winning neuron is active after you've done all this, uh, after you've run it through the activation function. And then the learning between these different regions uses just a regular heavy and learning rule. And I do believe she's using uh, sum of squares weight normalization 
to keep these weights within, uh, within a reasonable uh, limits. Okay, so that you've seen before. This part you probably haven't. Um, and this is a type of heavy in learning that, uh, that has some biological plausibility, but has, it's sort of a semi-supervised heavy, heavy in learning. Uh, and it has a lot of uh, interesting aspects to it. And it is complicated for me to explain. Uh, I'll try. In uh, the equations, I have to admit, are, are complicated uh, to look at. Uh, but it, I'll try and do this pictorially. But instead of just heavy in learning, you have uh, basically target activities that you might want. And then you have updates to these activities to try and match this. So that's why it's semi-supervised. So what I mean by that is, let's do this pictorially. So let's say I had a desired result. So this two-layer network. Uh, and the color coding is the desired result. So that's my desired result. So I have a start of the two layer network. I allow it to kind of freely be active uh, based on you know, the current inputs. And then I clamp one side. And then I update the weights based, based on trying to let, having these kind of uh, reverberate and get close to this, uh, get weights that close to um, making this, this activity. Then I let it run free again. And then I clamp the other side. And then I do another round of updates. And over time, you will start to get, you know, based on this kind of semi-supervised learning, you, you'll, you'll get uh, your desired result and the appropriate weights. And I'm showing you this in two layers, but L means it could be in a multi-layer network. So this has been used by a, a number of people. Uh, we didn't come up with it, uh, but it worked very well. And there's some biological plausibility to it. And so how it was applied here was after the indexing, you had that free state, and then you would do the clamping of both sides of, of here and here, and then this testing is, is after the weights are, are learned. Uh, this is the testing actually, because the arrows are missing. This is the testing when we uh, actually would do artificial lesions of the hippocampus, okay? Um, I know that's brief and, and this is complicated, but if you're interested in learning more about contrastive heavy and learning, I would recommend going to uh, the paper and then following up on um, the work by uh, Javier Movellan, who introduced this a long time ago, and I think there's more recent work of, of how people have used it over the years. So why do I say this might be biologically plausible? Well, when you have a context presentation, uh, there's synchronous, uh, at, I think at a, a, what's known as a theta rhythm, which is like eight to 12 Hertz. Uh, between the dorsal hippocampus and the medial prefrontal cortex. And I think this is the nucleus reunions. And this was a um, review of work by, uh, by the late Howard Eichenbaum in showing that contextual cues could cause this bias, but the, uh, the reverberation between these was, was important to cause synchrony between these areas, both uh, and also uh, during memory context pre presentation and also memory retrieval. Uh, and the slim framework suggests that this resonance occurs when there's a familiar schema. And in, our, in the model, the clamping and unclamping, which you do multiple times, uh, which, are, which are epochs, uh, would, could, uh, would and could be related to this uh, synchronous activity between these two regions. And another, uh, Another piece of evidence that fits with using contrastive heavy and learning is a rewarding experience that actually, uh, when you put these, uh, pair these associations together, uh, are prior, prioritized in hippocampal replay. So the, uh, the reverberation between this, the number of epochs might be also related to hippocampal replay and replaying something that was 
salient and potentially rewarding uh, to actually uh, consolidate that information. Now, this was all well and good. We, we struggled with this model for a while, but I, I should say Tiffany struggled with this model for a while, and then realized that it needed something else to actually uh, signal uh, when something is novel and new, uh, and has to go into a new schema, or when something is novel but familiar, uh, that um, should be uh, integrated with an existing schema. And so she looked at uh, evidence of neuromodulation that actually gave signals like that. And so she made an abstract model of neural, or abstract uh, you know, neural net layer of neuromodulation of some neurons that respond when something's familiar, some neurons that respond when something is novel. And the bottom line is that uh, you have a number of epochs and the more neuromodulation in general between these two, the more epochs uh, you'll, you'll run. So the more uh, contrastive heavy in learning. Now, if an object is novel, but the context is unfamiliar, then you would want to drive the hippocampus uh, and, and make a new, and create a new schema. But if an object is novel and the context is familiar, then the object can be added to the existing schema. And having these two types of neuromodulation allowed to make that, that switch between creating a new schema or putting something into an existing schema. And just how it was implemented kind of briefly, uh, if something was familiar, every time you saw it again, you'd increase the weight going into the medial prefrontal cortex. Uh, if something was novel, uh, every time you saw that thing again, uh, it became less novel, so you actually depress the weight over time in the hippocampus. Uh, and then these, ac these activities were literally multiplied together to give you the number of epochs, so how many reverberations you need between the medial, medial prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. Okay? So complicated model, but I think hopefully you get kind of schematically how this works and, and how it uh, was designed to, to follow what we know about uh, the, the brain areas and what they're doing in this kind of task. So again, she followed very, very closely this timeline and task uh, for the rats in, in her model and showed very similar performance. So it learned the schema. And let's look at uh, here two new, uh, af after learning the schema, two new paired associations were given and it learns those well. And then we did a lesion of the artificial lesion of the hippocampus and showed that it still was able to retain the original paired associations and the two new ones that were added. See, this hippocampal lesion looks almost identical to the control. And then what if you add two more after the lesion? Uh, and again, just like uh, the original rat data, that the hippocampal lesion uh, means that you need it to actually put new paired associations, but this shows that it can do very rapid consolidation if it fits within the schema. And then she did the second schema performance and learned a new uh, different schema, showed that without a hippocampus, uh, you would not be able to learn that new schema. Uh, but if you go back to the original schema, uh, the, the model remembers the original, the original schema. So it's been consolidated in her model into uh, the, the cortex. So really nicely replicated uh, those results. Um, so what are some of the conclusions in, from this for, for neurobiology and also machine learning? Uh, I think some of the, the the predictions and contributions were uh, showing that you could have this uh, hippocampal indexing scheme uh, and having it sparse separates these different representations. So there's not too much overlap. Uh, having a, a medial prefrontal 
cortex that can recognize context and control which indices in the hippocampus should be active. And then that um, neuromodulation is necessary for this rapid consolidation and it's based on the familiarity and novelty of an item. Now for machine learning, uh, hopefully you could see that going back and forth between multiple schemas, it prevented catastrophic forgetting by contextual gating. Um, and this dual stream model uh, of indexing and representation uh, could be scaled up. Uh, it seems like nicely designed, especially because it's sparse coding that it could scale up to much larger, more interesting problems. And it also uh, is, a, is a biologically plausible way of dealing with few shot learning. Um, the, the, the training epics um, and faster learning rate for something that, that's, uh, that's novel, but fits within a familiar schema. Okay, any questions on the model before I go into the uh, robotics version of the model? All right, so uh, with uh, Parak Kashyap, uh, Tiffany and I actually said, well, let's see if we can apply this model to something, uh, you know, some real world problem uh, and, and uh, something that actually could be useful for, uh, you know, assistive robotics, uh, having contextual awareness in, in, assist, in, a, in a robot. So uh, some of you familiar with our lab know that we have this robot from Toyota called the Human Support Robot. Uh, we call it Carl Senior for Carl Support Robot. It's designed to work in households. It's got a sweeping LIDAR uh, that you can build maps. So SLAM stands for simultaneous uh, localization and mapping. And it's a, a very common method in robotics to actually build maps of environments. It's got an arm, so we can manipulate objects. And it's got a camera, so it's got, like the cameras you've been using in WeBots, red, green, blue, but this D stands for depth. So the camera also can give you uh, how far objects are. So you can get like a 3D image from this, uh, this, uh, this robot or, or this type of sensor. And, um, so using this robot, she set up, she and Harak set up an experimental design that, that mimicked uh, the rat design, but in a, in a real environment, in a non-laboratory environment. So again, you learn a single schema, which was a classroom, uh, and you train the robot to, uh, to uh, learn what objects belong in a classroom. And then you test with new paired associations, you replace one object with another. And then after that experiment, we want to see if it can maintain multiple schemas. So we uh, trained the robot uh, going around a break room that had items that you'd find, you know, in a break room where people sit around and eat. And then the third experiment was to prompt the schema. So test uh, if it never was explicitly trained to retrieve an object, but an object that fit within a schema, if you presented it, cued it, uh, would the robot be able to find that object quickly? So it nicely fits uh, along the same lines as let's say it all, um, say it all experiment. So here's the rooms. This is the classroom schema. And it had objects you'd find in a classroom, like something to drink, uh, uh, books. I think there was a laptop, uh, mouse, keyboard, uh, backpack. Um, and a teddy bear, because I guess a classroom needs a teddy bear. Uh, and then uh, the other room was a break room. So this is, these are in our lab, but the rooms have different things. So there's a lot of food items on the table, uh, microwave and a toaster in the background. And um, the robot uh, with its SLAM system, LIDAR and 3D camera is able to build maps uh, of the outlines of these environments and, and localize itself. Uh, so in, in a sense, it's able to do uh, place localization, but it doesn't know anything about these objects. And, and the map is, is really the outline of, uh, you know, uh, of major objects because uh, to give you an idea of how LIDAR works. Uh, this is the LIDAR here. So it sends out a, a, a laser beam, a light beam that kind of goes from here and sweeps around to here. Uh, and it can go out like 
up to like 10 meters. Uh, but it, if, if you think about it, it's just a, a one-dimensional sweep. So you get uh, distances to walls and, and tables and things. Uh, so it has no information about uh, what things are, but it can give you nice outlines. You can build a really good map uh, with, with these, uh, with these algor SLAM algorithms and, and get able to localize and map your environment. And then adding the camera on top, then you can kind of match where objects are in the environment. So that's the idea. This is the layout. Um, and uh, shoot, I forget which uh, free, I think this was either the Coco data set, I forget now. <laughs> There's one of the data sets that you can, uh, or it might have been the uh, you only look once YOLO data set uh, that, that actually can recognize objects and give you a bounding box around the objects. So she, she took that and then retrained it on the objects in our environment, uh, in, in our setup. Uh, and, and so that worked well. So that was how we got the object recognition. And then designed this GUI. Uh, so Harak and her designed this GUI that you could, uh, and this is the resulting SLAM map here, which nicely fits the two rooms. Uh, this is the classroom and this is the break room. So there is a connection between them. Uh, and these dots are different place cells in the model for these different rooms. So how does this work? So someone at the GUI cues in an item to pick up. And so we're queuing it to pick up the teddy bear. It's in the classroom. It looks around. So the first time, so it's looking for a teddy bear, but it's also building up a schema of the objects that belong in this room. And it takes a long time but it's getting a lot of information. Finds the teddy bear and it's task is to drop it off somewhere. Now this is four trials later and it knows exactly where the teddy bear should be and so it retrieves it very quickly. So then we put it in the break room. This is the second schema and tell it to retrieve a cup. And this is the first time. So it's starting to build up, uh, you know, what, go, what goes in the break room schema. It takes a while to find the cup, but it finds it. And this is trial four, and it knows right where the cup is. And rapidly retrieves it and puts it back. Okay, so this is the, um, going back to the original schema. So it's able to remember where objects were. So it hasn't lost its memory of the original scheme in the classroom. And this is the third experiment where you can cue it with an object it's never been asked to retrieve before but it knows that objects should, like a banana, should be found on the break room table and then immediately uh, sends its search there and grabs a banana. Okay, so let's look at the results in detail. Um, this shows the um, activation of the neuron that, that would go with the place that goes to the object. And this shows the retrieval time. So as it learns, uh, the activation goes up and the retrieval time goes down. And then, um, let's see, 1B was replaced one object with another. So now it's queued with a, a brand new paired association. And it retrieves that very quickly because it fits within a schema. And let's go to the performance on the second experiment. So now it learns a different schema and you see very good performance, uh, but then you put it back into the classroom and it hasn't forgotten that uh, what objects go where in the classroom. And then if you give it a novel object, uh, then it's very something that it hasn't been asked to retrieve, but it fits within a schema. It's very quick in finding it. And just to give you an idea of what that means with a novel object. So if I queued it with a book, it would say uh, the likelihood, these are activities in its place cells. Uh, so the place cells are most active. Uh, the book would be by the teacher uh, on the desk in the classroom. Uh, this is kind of the edge of that desk there, but not in the break room. But if you queue with a banana, it says, well, that doesn't fit within the classroom, but a banana should be somewhere on the table where the, the other food items were. So this really nicely showed, I think, uh, some of the issues uh, in 
uh, in lifelong learning in, in AI, but in a robotic uh, application, uh, catastrophic forgetting, able to learn over time, switching tasks, and I should have also added a few shot learning. Uh, and you know, this might be useful for assistive robotics or, or support robots. Um, the robot was designed by Toyota to be an assistive technology, and context is very important when determining how to carry out tasks. Not just the context of rooms, but context of the person's needs. Uh, so maintaining schemas of different rooms or situations might allow uh, the robot to be more aware of what the person needs uh, of the context and act more appropriately and naturally. Okay, any questions on the schema model? Okay, well, I, I thought this model was very uh, interesting because it puts a lot of ideas together about hippocampus, about learning, uh, about maybe not necessarily reinforcement learning, but the, uh, it, it is sort of acting like getting reinforcement by uh, what items to be picked up. And the contrastive Hebbian learning is an interesting way of doing semi-supervised semi uh, learning. Okay, so let's, um, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about a demonstration of action selection and, um, and go back to uh, something like the subsumption architecture. So before I run the demo, uh, I want to introduce you to Capera. Capera is a, a pretty good workhorse robot. It's about the size of the palm of my hand, so it's very small and compact. Uh, but it has eight distance sensors, six on the front, two on the back. Uh, and it's got a lot of things you can add on it. So you can add a gripper to it. And this block is actually its camera. Uh, and, and when people use this, uh, it's been used a lot in cognitive robotics. And because of its size, and you can hook up a, a power cable to it, uh, it's been used in evolutionary robotics too, where you have to run the robot for many generations. So I thought it'd be good to play with this robot. Um, and this is the setup I came up with. And, and I'll share this, this model with you uh, after class. But here's the Capera. It's in this room, kind of blank room, but there's this red stick here, and this is its view. Uh, and um, I'm not gonna have learning this week. We're gonna build on this next week and add context, uh, but it has several actions. It has to, it, it explores, it finds the red stick, it will go to these walls, it'll drop the stick off, it'll wall follow and, and avoid things. Uh, so, I th this nicely demonstrates uh, a method related to subsumption architecture, which is state control with transitions. And this is commonly used in embedded systems, and, and it really is um, similar to subsumption architecture. So each of its behaviors uh, is a state, and so that's the blue ellipse. And then there's transitions between states, which occur because of some sensory event. And those are, those are the labeled arrows. So in the case of this demonstration, there's an explore state where it explores around. If it sees a red object, that makes a transition to the get object state, which means it'll track towards that object. And then if it picks it up, it wants to drop it off. So then it, that picking up the object leads it to finding a wall state. Then it has to orient to the wall. So once it's facing the wall, then it can drop off the object. Once it's dropped off the object, then it'll follow the wall for a little time. Uh, after that amount of time elapses, it'll avoid the wall and then go back to the explore state because it's, the sensors say it's cleared that, cleared uh, whatever obstacle. If the explore state runs into something, that's not a red object, or it's too close to the red object, uh, it will, uh, that's an obstacle uh, sensory event, it'll trigger the avoid state until it's cleared that obstacle and then it'll go back to explore. 
So this is nicely explains this behavior. And uh, I've used various in, in both the uh, neuro robotics models and actually uh, production software for a uh, medical device, this, this kind of uh, diagram and, and also a way to drive the design of, of software. So let's take a look at the setup for real. And before I run it, I'm not gonna go through all this code. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it for you, but I do wanna highlight the design. So there are states, just like I explained, find wall, follow wall, avoid, explore, get object, drop object. Um, there are some other uh, sensory uh, transitions and, um, and substates, but these are the main states, just like in the diagram. So it should follow that diagram I just showed you. Uh, there's a gripper, so you can read uh, some of this code on how to use the gripper or how I use the gripper. It also, uh, I, I uh, wrote a routine to track an object. So given an object, uh, it will actually orient towards, and I'll show you that in action. But uh, this, this is, I, I've used something like this. I can't count how many times for, uh, for my robot experiments. And then each state has a routine and it returns uh, a Boolean that's true when the state is complete. And the state is complete when there's some sensory event. All right, so for example, finding wall, like I said, um, if, if, it, if its front sensors uh, say that, it, well, actually if it starts to get close, it then orients to the wall. But once it's close to the wall, and facing the wall with its two front sensors, then it sets the flag to true. That sensory event says that this state is done and you should transition to a new state. So each of these routines follows this method. The only one that differs is explore, because the explore has two different, um, two different possible state transitions out of it. So it's still a Boolean, so that we return false if it hasn't completed. But if one of those sensory events happens, then in C, I can't remember in other languages, anything that's non-zero is true. <laughs> so uh, if we set this to, I think this is one, that the, the sensory event was avoid, then it'll transition to avoid. Or if the sensory event uh, was, it saw an object, then it'll actually transition to the state get object. And these are the other states. But what, once you design it like this, it makes for very compact code. I just switch on the state and then I check if that state is complete. And then I set the state to the new, uh, transition to the new state. And then the next time, let's say a transition to avoid, then it starts going here and stays in the state until avoid says true, I've completed the state. Once it's true, then it goes to uh, the explore state and so on. And so this code can be kind of very compact. Uh, and, and I think it's a nice design and it's really doing subsumption architecture, but it's, uh, this is one way to code that up. All right, so let's see this. Let's run this guy. There he goes, he sees the red stick. He orients towards it. Once he's close, opens it up, grabs it. I didn't do too much physics, so he actually pierces it, <laughs> but the stick is fine, don't you worry. Now he's just going straight till he hits a wall. So we're down here, it says we're in the find wall state. Once it gets to the wall, it'll orient towards the wall, drop off the stick, and sometimes it has trouble dropping it off. <laughs> now it's in the follow wall state. And once that's complete, it'll go avoid the wall. I forget how long this goes. And one thing I do with a stick is I, I put it in supervised mode. So uh, once it's gotten away from the wall, like now it's in the avoid state, I put it back upright so it can find it again. So if we run this guy a little faster. All 
part of the transfer. So, so that's what it does. Does this all day. We'll pick up the stick, orient, drop it off, follow wall. But I think it's a good basis. Uh, it's doing action selection without learning right now, uh, very much in a basal ganglia way. And um, it's something that we can build on, which I'll, I'll do next week uh, to actually add some salience to this and some learning so it actually uh, looks a little more interesting. I can see even that. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, that works better. So there you go, it's a little faster. All right, so you get the idea. But for a complicated set of behaviors, this is nice clean code actually to handle those behaviors. Any questions on that guy? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll release this code for you. You might want to look at it. I, I actually, I, I think you should look at it. Uh, I will build on it for next week to add some salience. Uh, so it's more like uh, the basal ganglia model by Prescott's group and more like next week's case study, which is, um, which uh, is uh, anxiety and curiosity in, in a robot. So we'll, we'll give it some sort of salience uh, to make it actually have a trade-off between anxiety, being anxious or curious. And, and next week's uh, lecture is, is on behavioral trade-offs. So that'll be nice uh, fitting. But, but definitely look at this code to see how it's designed and how you can nicely make uh, a design like this uh, and work it out on paper and then realize it very uh, straightforwardly in, in, uh, in software. All right, so if there's no questions, let's go on to a little bit of overview for the midterm. So um, the grades were, you know, roughly, uh, you know, around this with a median of 27. I, I have to admit, I, I, I was pretty lenient on the grading. Um, and, and I was, I, I also have to admit, I was a little disappointed in how the midterms came out. And that might be on, on me, but uh, there were some common mistakes. And I wanna go over this, because uh, I wanna, we should definitely resolve it going into the, uh, the final project. We're finishing up week six, so we're, we should be starting to think about what we wanna do for the final project. Um, some common things, uh, it's hard to, apply learning rules to a task. Uh, and if you're not experienced doing this, uh, it, it's difficult, uh, especially starting from scratch. And representing representing the inputs, outputs, and how the, the robot gets feedback is the key. So you really have to think about how to represent this and, and, what, the, um, and what the environment uh, kind of feedback will be. Uh, some, uh, I suppose, some, some annoying kind of uh, problems were, um, sorry, waiting for my phone to stop ringing. All right, uh, it, some of the projects were not self-contained. Um, so you, if you include non-standard libraries, you can't assume that I, um, I have them. Uh, so uh, I can't run them and I do want to run your projects that way I can give you better feedback. So, so don't include uh, library, don't non-standard libraries, uh, and don't use pre-trained -pre networks. Uh, I, I, I get concerned about people relying too much on pre-trained networks because it's kind of a crutch. Uh, the point of, of these projects is to understand how to build some of these learning rules and uh, object uh, recognition and things like that from scratch. Uh, so that might limit the things you can do, but at least when you do it from scratch, you'll know how it works. Uh, and so we've been trying to give you throughout the quarter, you know, the, the equations and examples of how to do some of these things. Uh, so uh, don't use pre-trained networks. And that fits with the, the first thing. That means there's some non-standard library that I would have to have. Um, some of you just tweaked an earlier assignment. I mean, 
I like it when you build off an assignment, but you want to come up with novel problems because uh, that will give you a true understanding of some of the ideas from the lectures. And the assignments are to give you ideas and, and to provide another lesson, but I want you to really take that and do something different. Uh, and a few of you didn't really create a, a robot task. Uh, so the point of this is it's, uh, this is not just pure AI. Uh, we don't wanna do AI simulations in this course. Uh, that's, that's a subject for a whole bunch of different courses. Uh, just because there's a robot doesn't mean it's acting like a robot. So the robot, any neural robot or a robot, and especially even, even in Webots, which is a simula simulator, uh, should have active sensing. So it should be reading from sensors and that should be leading to driving some sort of actuators. Uh, and you know, my example just I showed you now, that's leading to driving the wheels and, and the gripper, okay? Uh, you can, in simulations uh, and in Webots, you can get around that, especially with supervisor mode, uh, but that's not the point. If you were using a real robot, then there's no way uh, you could do that. So. Uh, treat this as a real robot that actually has real sensors. And um, in the world, this is what, during my postdoc, my postdoc advisor drilled one of these catchphrases to me, the world is an unlabeled place. So that's one of the reasons we're using robots that have to learn things on their own. Uh, so don't give labels to everything, have it discover what it needs to discover. Uh, so that was the point of uh, one of the original uh, case studies I did with Darwin 7 was, uh, even though those blocks had pretty salient uh, patterns on them, it had to discover what those meant. Uh, there were no labels saying stripes are good and blobs are bad. It, some, it, it had to discover it on its own through its own experience. So I want you to start thinking like that. Uh, you can keep your simulations simple, but I want you to follow those rules because that's, that's the, the, the basis of neural robotics. And I believe um, the most common mistake was waiting until the last minute to code up some of these things. Uh, I, I just get that feeling based on some of the lack of questions and then some of the questions I got very late in the game. Um, robotics, even in a simulator, takes a lot of time and effort uh, and patience. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a different kind of uh, mentality to do this. So, so you have to give yourself some time. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not really that disappointed. Uh, this is difficult, and this is the first time I've taught the material. So, so that's part of the difficulty to uh, is trying to understand. And it's even more difficult because I'm having to teach this remotely. So I can't really see your faces and see, I can always tell when I'm teaching if like, something's not sinking in, I can go over it or, or people are more likely to ask questions. Uh, but it does take time. So, and, I do want you to get this out of, out of the course. Uh, I think even if you're not gonna do robotics, uh, being able to design projects like this will be important for your, your uh, dissertation and, and research. So going forward, um, I'm gonna move up the timeline a little bit. So I'm gonna announce the final project next week and, and the guidelines to it. Um, Next week is week seven, so we're, we are rapidly running out of time. I believe, let's look at the calendar uh, in a moment, but I want a project proposal by week eight. Uh, so I wanna know very early on what you propose on doing in, in more detail than, than I got uh, this time, uh, so that I can give you some early guidance. Uh, and then I want you to make some progress on your project and I'm not sure how I'll do this, but we'll, we'll set up individual meetings outside of class uh, so I can have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with each person about their project idea and, and give some guidance. Um, so if you look at the timeline, so I'll announce it next week. We still will do uh, these chapters and these demonstrations. Um, Week eight is, the, um, is, is Thanksgiving week. So I do want some project proposal by week eight. Uh, so I want some details uh, written in a brief report 
about what you plan on doing, the inputs, the outputs. I'll give you more guidance next week. I'm going to think about exactly what I'm, uh, I'll give you guidance exactly what I'm asking for. And then after the Thanksgiving break, uh, I want to set up meetings this, this week um, so that, and I guess that's, I did put a placeholder there for final projects, but it, we, meetings, individual meetings. And then somehow during week 10, I, I want some way of uh, you guys showing off what you did, uh, even if it's early stage to, uh, to all the other students. So, so we'll figure that out. Um, I'm thinking maybe we can make a, a short video um, of the, the robot and WeeBots and then also uh, a little narration and, and pictures, kind of like the videos I show of, uh, that I've shown of our work and, and other groups' work. Okay. All right, so let me stop sharing and see if there are any questions or comments. And please don't be shy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, as always, if you have any questions, concerns you want to bring up to me, uh, feel free to contact me through Slack or email. Um, I will be posting next week's chapter, which is on behavioral trade-offs. Uh, and I will, over the weekend, but uh, I will post uh, today's lecture as usual in, in the code that, uh, for the demonstration. Uh, so you can take a look at how to make the, the state uh, transition control, which might be useful for your projects. It actually makes the debugging uh, much cleaner too. So, I mean, that helps when you have multiple, the robot doing multiple things. Oh, John, were you saying something? I couldn't hear it. Nope, can't hear. <laughs> you can put it in chat and then I can repeat it to everyone else. Oh, wait, can no. you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I have a question about constructive heavy and learning. Does the system have to dwell on a, a particular set of stimuli while this back and forth is going on for this to work properly? Yeah. Uh, actually, it's contrastive. Did I say constructive? Contrastive heavy. Uh, it's my fault. Yeah. Um, so that's when you clamp. So uh, you can either do it semi-supervised or what Tiffany did was it was the activity, I think, in the indexing layer for a model got clamped. So whatever the activity at that time, and then uh, the connections between the representation, well here, <laughs> instead of using my hand, let's go back to that picture. Okay, so I mean, you have uh, con some, some cue, so you have activity here, and there's activity also in the hippocampus because it's basically doing a winner take all choosing these indexes. And so then you clamp that activity here and do the contrast of heavy learning so that it starts to try and uh, learn weights between these. Then after that, after an epic of that, you clamp this one, which has the cue and the action and this multimodal area. And then it, it then starts to do some updating of the weights between those. And if you do it enough times and it's the input activity is consistent, then you learn a, a nice mapping and association between these areas. The question I had was, do you have to kind of dwell in this, this state for a while before you go on to do something else? Yes, you have to dwell. Uh, and that's what the dwelling is this. So this is just one epoch. Right, so going through this free clamped update, free clamp the other one update. That's an epic. Uh, so you'd you, have to go through several epics then. Yeah, and the epics in her model were driven by 
uh, the modulation for familiarity and novelty. So right, thank if you. It was highly familiar and highly novel. Uh, you would do you dwell on it for a longer time. Okay, and, thank uh, you. Her her thought was that that's sort of like hippocampal replay when something is is highly salient or rewarding. Oh, you know, I I forgot one last thing before you all run away. Okay, can you see this slide? I got kind of messed up with, yes, can you see? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm teaching this course for undergraduates. Uh, it, it's gonna use a lot of the same material, but uh, we'll have to think about how to, uh, how to design it so in a way that uh, our psychology undergraduates uh, could uh, handle this. Uh, it's in the winter, I need TAs. Um, I don't know how many yet, depends how many people uh, sign up. Um, the class will be asynchronous. So a lot of these recordings that I'm doing now, I'll edit uh, so that they can uh, uh, watch the lectures. And then my experience with these students uh, in these undergraduates is a lot of them have never programmed before, uh, or if they have, they, they really haven't done it enough. So. So we'll use the class time to do hands-on instruction for Python and then hands-on instruction uh, because it's going to be remote uh, for WeBots. So I'm looking for TAs. Uh, you need to be comfortable with Python and WeBots. Uh, I think Python will be the best language for them. Uh, I can only have TAs that are cognitive science graduate students. So if this interests you uh, to be a TA for this, uh, Usually this class is a lot of fun and uh, the students get very entertained. Uh, it's very entertaining, but I've never done it remotely. So that, that's gonna be a challenge to uh, tap into their creativity. But uh, I, you can ask, uh, well, Junwei and Kashin have been TAs for this class before. So you can ask them what it's like to be a TA, but it will be drastically different than past times I've taught it. Anyway. If you're interested, contact me as soon as possible because uh, Clara and the department are, are going to be asking for uh, TA assignments pretty soon. Uh, so uh, I can give them a list of names of, of who, uh, who I want for TAs. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Just contact me directly if, if that's something that interests you. But do keep in mind, you it's going to be in Python, so you should be comfortable with using Python uh, and uh, we, we will use WeBots in some way, shape or form to, to do our, our kind of robotic experiments.